Let's see here. All right, we are live. So welcome back to Dappy Diversity. So today we've got a lot to talk about in our live stream. We're going to look at some statements that just came out that could mean more pain ahead for the entire crypto space uh, over the coming months. Okay, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at a lot of other updates that have happened in the space since our live stream yesterday. Again, we do these live streams Monday through Friday this channel. Just subscribe, turn on notifications. You're going to find out about those whenever we go live. We're going to take a quick look at the crypto markets, answer some of your questions, and a whole lot more. So if you're new around here, Hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step-by-step start to finish, definitely head on over to dappyversity.com forward slash bootcamp you started today. All right, so my camera's already like messing up on me this morning. I'm not really sure what's going on here. Maybe I can get it to focus on my... It's supposed to do the uh, automatic focus. I think I have to cover my eyes in order for it to do it, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Hopefully it'll stop working now. So anyways, we got people jumping in the chat here. We got technically Madison, David, uh, Automatic Beats, Cody, Jay Lee, uh, let's see here, Tina, uh, Doc Joe, I'm saying that right, Justin, Lelo, uh, Be Known, Lex, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so let's jump into this. Um, so hopefully my camera will stop freaking out on me here. I'm kind of trying to change things up a little bit. You know, I've got this light up here that I tried turning off, uh, seeing if that'll help. It gives it kind of more of a dark, uh, moody feel, but this camera's supposed to have pretty good low light performance, so hopefully it won't keep flashing. i got to figure out what's going on with that thing. Uh, anyway, so let's, let's jump into this. Let's talk about uh, some statements that just came out that uh, could be more pain ahead for crypto, especially in the coming months, okay? So one of the biggest themes of the entire crypto uh, space this year has been what's been going on with the broader economy, okay? Inflation has been the enemy across the board for pretty much all, um, you know, markets, okay? Crypto has been highly correlated to the stock market. If you look at the past year performance and you kind of lay the graphs over top one another you know the s p 500 and other major stock indices don't look too different from the crypto markets in their overall directionality of course crypto is more volatile um it has bigger upside and bigger downside okay uh but these look highly correlated and so one of the big reasons for this is what's been happening in the broader economy okay inflation has been a problem again i don't pretend to be a macroeconomics expert on this channel uh but it's like a genius to see that inflation is a problem everybody's talking about it and we've seen uh the central bank of the united states reverse course uh you know at the at the end of 2021 in november uh started to uh uh talk about basically changing course for its monetary policy to one of tightening, okay? And that's been the theme this whole year, basically raising interest rates to try to fight inflation, uh, you know, shrink the balance sheet uh, in this, with this, uh, from the central bank, okay, essentially to try to uh, curb inflation and get the economy, you know, back on track. So, um, you know, the, the market, uh, it, these riskier markets like crypto, growth-based markets don't really like uh, you know, tightening. They like they like loose monetary policy, generally speaking, okay, as to be a sponge for liquidity uh, that goes through the system, okay? And that's one of the reasons we've seen uh, crypto kind of do this all year. And, you know, what, one question we're kind of asking ourselves every month or so is like, what's happening with inflation? Like, is inflation coming down? If it's coming down, that could be a sign that, you know, we could kind of get back on track uh, with a more accommodating uh uh, monetary policy for this type of environment. And so, you know, every month we're like like looking for statements from the uh, central bank to see what they're going to say. And earlier this week I talked about, hey, you know, watch out. We've got uh, some statements coming out on Friday um, from the central bank that could have an impact on the crypto markets as well as other markets and give us some clues as to where things are headed. So um, this morning we got some statements from... Uh, from Fed Chairman Jerome Powell talking about, from from Jackson Hole, uh, which we're talking about more pain, okay? Some pain ahead as the Fed fights to bring down inflation, okay? So Powell spoke this morning, uh, pledging that the central bank will use tools forcefully, okay, to attack inflation that is still running near its highest level in more than 40 years. Okay, in the annual Jackson Hole Wyoming policy speech, uh, he added higher interest rates will likely persist for some time. Okay, the historical records caution strongly against prematurely loosening policies, so basically, you know, trying to, you know, do a pivot to loosen policy before, um, you know, things look like they're quote unquote under control. Um, so basically, the remarks came amid signs that inflation may have peaked, but it's not showing any marked sign of decline. So basically, uh, you know, Powell said the Fed's not going to be swayed by a month or two of positive data. 
and that will likely continue to uh, con- continue on the direction which could cause more pain for pretty much every single market. All right. So basically, here's an additional statement. So while interest rates, slower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. Okay. Um, these are unfortunate costs of reducing inflation, but a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. Of course, you know, the federal mandates to keep price stable as part of the federal mandate, um, or Federal Reserve mandate, um, and also maintain maximum employment. So basically, we're seeing stocks briefly extend losses as it began to speak. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing, if you go check on what's happened to stocks, uh, over the past, you know, one day, <laughs> this was basically our quick blip, and then eh, we're pretty much down from here. Okay, uh, so the market is not reacting favorably to this type of talk uh, in the short term. Okay, crypto is kind of doing the same thing. Let's just take a quick look here. So Bitcoin's back down to the twenty thousand dollar level. Okay, we saw this sort of uh, big pump here, and then we're kind of a dump. All right, we're gonna continue on our downward trajectory. So let's just continue on looking here. So the speech was unusually brief, whereas Fed leaders, including Powell, often have used the Jackson Hole Symposium as an opportunity to outline broad policy shifts. Powell's remarks Friday uh, basically clocked in about eight minutes. So. Um, you know, we're not going to see, I think the whole point here is that, you know, in, instead of a longer thing that outline policy shifts, it's sort of the opposite. It's sort of a short to the point, uh, statement that reemphasizes that they're not really shifting directions, that things are just kind of going on, um, as they have been business as usual, uh, sort of the theme of this year has been pain and it looks like the theme is going to continue to be pain, uh, based on the actions that they intend to inflict. So, um, Price stability is responsibility of the Federal Reserve and served as a better of our economy. That's what he's saying before. That's the whole idea of trying to keep uh, inflation under control without price stability. The economy does not work for everyone. So basically, uh, the next we were kind of in limbo until next meeting in September to see if uh, the Federal Open Market Committee will actually raise interest rates by you know how, how much they're going to raise them. Is it going to be by three quarters of a basis point? Is it going to be by half a basis point? Um, the market's kind of split between that. Uh, some of the, the traders are pricing in a 51% probability of a half a point move, so more in favor of a smaller look. But So what does this mean in the short term? In the short term, you know, markets are not reacting favorably to this. Uh, you know, this Early this week, uh, Monday, when I talked about some of the important events happening in crypto, as I said, expect volatility around this event. Okay. So I don't think the market's taking this as good news in the short term. It's definitely interpreting it as a hawkish stance. So you know, what does it mean for the for the midterm to the long term? So you know, of course, long term, my opinion, um, you know, I am definitely on the side of crypto growing and bullish uh, over long term time horizon. But it's going to make it hard for us to re- reverse course and become too bullish uh, while we're while we still have sort of this sentiment. You know, it's sort of like don't fight the Fed type situation. It's really hard to fight the Fed and be aggressively bullish uh, when we're in this type of environment. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that crypto has to go back to Goblin Town, that we have to, you know, go back to our lows and break them and make new lows and ultimately find a bottom of this bear market, you know, much later. I think that's what a lot of people are interpreting here and are just waiting for it, saying, oh, the bottom's not in. We've got to go further and further and further. That's not necessarily my view, okay? There's still a significant number of reasons to think that we bottomed earlier this summer. I'm not saying that's exactly what happened, okay? There's no nobody actually knows for sure. Anybody who tells you that they know for sure, um, well, <laughs> be very highly skeptical of that person, okay? Um, so, anyways, so it doesn't necessarily mean that we're, you know, just going to go down uh, forever, and that it's going to take us forever to, you know, find the bottom of this market. I do think we are going to eventually resume that uptrend, uh, but it's going to be hard to do that aggressively in this environment. It doesn't mean it can't even trend higher, uh, but it's just going to be hard. It's going to be hard to see some type of explosive, you know, move in assets like Bitcoin uh, in this type of environment. Now, that being said, we do have the ETH merge coming up really soon. Okay, uh, you know, Ethereum is switching to proof of stake. That is a huge, um, 
event in the crypto space that, you know, it's one of the biggest events in all of crypto's history. Uh, it's the biggest event in Ethereum's history for sure. And there's still room uh, for the merge trade to play out. Okay. So let's take, let's go take a look at the calendar here. Um, days until I'm going to continue looking. I'm just going to continue on with September 15th as the merge date. If you watched the video yesterday, uh, you of course, or if you've seen in my previous, you know, kind of live stream talking about this. Of course, we don't exactly know when the Ethereum merge is going to happen. It's based on the total terminal difficulty of the blockchain. Okay. Which basically means how hard is it to mine blocks? And as soon you know, there's a difficulty bomb is going to go off, and the difficulty is going to increase. And as soon as you max that, you reach that threshold, it's going to cross it, and then proof of stake is going to get switched on essentially. So um, that's about 20 days away. Could be a little bit sooner, even could could be could be 15 days away, depending on uh, when when the total terminal difficulty reaches. So it could be September 10th. That's the fastest we could see it. Could be later than that. Could be a September 20th. So somewhere between 15 and 25 days. So either. Way Way you slice it it's only two to three weeks okay um and we still have time for that merge trade to play out if it's going to happen okay which could be a short-term uh bullish thing for eth now some people think it's already priced in some people think the merge trade's kind of already happened we've seen that pump uh you know up to here right up to about two thousand dollars um and that the smart money's out you know ahead of the merge trade um but we'll see we'll see we'll see Let me know what y'all think down below. Are we still going to see more of the merge trade happen for Ethereum? Are we going to see uh, prices go up and see a pump and then a subsequent dump or a dump before the merge? Let me know Let me know what y'all think in the comment section below. In my personal views, we're going to see some volatility around the merge event in what one form or fashion, whether it's right before the merge event or right after, we're likely to see some sort of like sharp selling. I, that's just really likely in my opinion, okay? Now, it's a game of chicken to know uh, when that is going to be. Again, it's not financial advice. I'm not telling you to buy or sell any crypto based on this information. Uh, I don't even hang my own hat on this. I'm not going to trade ETH around the merge. I'm holding it for the long term, okay? Uh, I'm not trying to time it, but um, you know it's it's very likely, in my opinion, that we'll see volatility on either side of that event. It's just just kind of typical by how these things work. But let's say we see that volatility event and we see some you know downside, uh, some sharp selling around the merge. Then over time, like I, I'm so bullish on um, what the merge is going to do for Ethereum itself, the actual asset that's going to affect the economics and just by sheer supply and demand economics just by math uh that the merge is actually going to have uh positive a positive price impact on ether over time assuming that assuming that nothing goes wrong with the merge that nothing like sort of taints people's view of eth after the merge all that type of stuff i mean you don't know what you don't know there there's there's always risks when you're talking about major technological shifts like this okay um, but assuming all that stuff works out smoothly, which that's what I'm betting on for sure, um, then you know, over time the merge, in my opinion, will have a will have a positive pr price impact on Ether itself, assuming that these things happen, and also assuming that the network adoption at least stays the same as it is now, which I an anticipate that it will grow over time. So uh, let's see here. Somebody says, I see ETH head and shoulder heading to 1K. So this is turn the money printer on. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's take a look at a couple other things here before we continue on. So, you know, one big theme uh, when we're talking about Ethereum, you know, it's going in the space of the ongoing saga uh, with Tornado Cash, okay? So, you know, one thing people are worried about with uh, Ethereum potentially uh, surrounding the merge is what's going on with the um, 
you know, sanctions that have been put in place. Okay. So, you know, what is Tornado Cash? Well, it's a privacy solution for Ethereum. You know, it's basically an app powered by smart contracts where you can send cryptocurrency to it and then you can withdraw it on the other side to a different wallet and it makes it really hard to trace um, the wallet you deposited with and the wallet you, that you withdrew uh, from. So basically the whole idea is if you want to uh, unlink your wallets, like it's hard, hard to know, like it's just for privacy. Let's say you, ha you have a fresh wallet, you want to fund it. Well, you've only got a few options. You could withdraw directly from a centralized exchange, okay? Or you could send it from another Ethereum wallet, okay? Or you could try to use a dApp, you know, where you try to facilitate the transfer in some way, and that, that's going to have mixed results. Uh, so it's a, it, it, in most cases, it's either people are going to know who you were because you were kyc on, on an exchange, or uh, or you don't maybe don't trust the exchange, right, to deposit your funds and withdraw, or like, you know, if you send it from one wallet to another, it's really easy to be like, okay, this person probably owns both these wallets, or even if you send it like to a bunch of different wallets and it like did a round robin type thing, like it's not that hard to track, right? So anyways, Tornado Cash, the whole idea is that it, it, you deposit into an anonymity set, and then you withdraw on the other side, it makes it really hard to figure out that when you after you withdrew what your address was when you deposited. So anyways, uh, you know, we've seen Tornado Cash sanctioned, that application sanctioned by the U.S. government. Um, so it's a historical precedent. It's the first time we've ever seen anything like this happen. Okay. And uh, of course, there's some drama about this with the Ethereum merge. People are worried about censorship happening on the protocol level. Basically, whenever validators uh, start running proof of stake, that you might have OFAC compliant validators who don't validate blocks to, uh, or don't validate transactions that go towards amount of cash since it's sanctioned. So this is a huge source of drama. Uh, but I saw this tweet thread come up yesterday. All right, that I thought was pretty uh, worth worth checking out. I'll put a link to it in the in the resources here, um, just so that you all can kind of see some perspective on this. Okay, um, so now it's in the live chat. So, anyways, uh, new detailed factual explanation of how Tornado Cash works. So, huge thanks to these folks here for this unbiased description of exactly how the contracts function. It confirms a level of decentralization that was surprising even to me. Okay. Um, so this is from Coin Center put this out, all right? So none of the core Tornado Cash contracts that provide privacy tools to users can be upgraded, changed, or altered. So the privacy that the users get from these contracts is guaranteed with math and software that is as immutable as the blockchain itself. So it works with zero-knowledge cryptography. Uh, to the extent that any OFAC sanctioned addresses retain a human operator role, they are either mere donation addresses to support software development, ancillary services that never control users' tokens, or defunct, never used addresses. Okay. So, anyways, the explainer they published uh, comes a complete appendix uh, that lists every contract, what it does, and the degree that it has or once had any human control in its operations. So, you can see the addresses, what they do, and how they were, you know, uh, what, their, what their relationship is to actually any human operators. So basically, the, addition, the explainer makes clear that Tornado Cash is not, in any sense, in any factual sense, a mixer. Okay, so that that term is often used to describe what Tornado Cash is. I've personally used it myself because it's the easiest uh, explanation that most people identify with. Uh, you know, it, it has, they have described themselves as a privacy solution, so I usually also say that as well. Uh, anyway, thanks to zero knowledge proofs, privacy is assured even through even though users can only ever deposit or withdraw their own specific tokens. Okay. Uh, from these facts, uh, we can begin to build stronger legal arguments that OFAC overstepped its statutory authority in sanctioning Tornado Cash. And he has an update here. So the argument has four main points. One, the contracts themselves and the software that controls their operation are not foreign nationals, okay, or their property, and therefore cannot be targets of sanctions. Okay, so this is sort of like pushback on a on legal basis here. Again, I'm not a legal expert, so I don't, I don't exactly know how this holds water. Okay, I'm just just, just bringing up this uh, viewpoint here because it's at least compelling to talk about. Uh, to the extent everyone has property in these addresses, it's because they've sought the privacy provided by those software tools that property is their own, and no one else has any meaningful control or ownership rights to that property. That's sort of the idea of non-custodial software or decentralized software. Is nobody, it's like nobody else is controlling it. You've put it into this uh, piece of software that is decentralized. Only you can deposit and only you can withdraw. Like nobody else can actually touch that crypto once it's in there. 
So if it's an Americans, if it's an Americans property or law abiding person who is not sanctioned, uh, then that property is also not properly the subject of sanctions. Uh, moreover, that property is not mixed, commingled, or under any shared control with any sanctioned person's property. So part of that's talking about, um, you know, if if they're worried about you know money laundering or facilitating transactions with other, uh, you know, sanctioned countries, for example. Uh, then your funds wouldn't actually be commingled with theirs at all. So when a person uses front of cash uh, to put their privacy, they argue uh, they're, they're not even up, even engaged in times of activities that IEEPA empowers uh, the president to block. Okay. So, anyways, I, I'm not going to go through every single point here. There's there's several more left that you can check out in the tweet storm, but it's pretty compelling. Uh, conversation. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. Are we going to see pushback on the OFAC sanctions? Could this eventually be reversed? You know, could the privacy debate for Tornado Cash and Ethereum eventually just be, you know, a not even issue anymore? Okay. Um, it's just like all these other sort of regulations we've seen sort of slapped on the crypto space. They just sort of slap on and walk away. All right. And, but we do see, uh, you know, resistance mounting and, you know, certain areas where people actually have the legal chops, I would say, to craft a response and craft some sort of pushback. Okay. We saw this with, uh, we saw this with some of the regulations that were coming down uh, the pike with the infrastructure bill with crypto, uh, some of the other early regulations as well. Uh, it's typically just sort of slap it on there, walk away, and then it put it on you to try to actually push back. But we are seeing those things push back. I think that we have the resources. We definitely have the capital in the crypto industry to fund those resources or to make this, uh, you know, happen. And it's for the betterment of the entire space that we uh, cooperate in order to do that. How will the merge affect layer two protocols, rollups, etc.? won't meaningfully affect them. Somebody says, my opinion on USDT, is it safe, not financial advice, of course. So one interesting thing we saw in USDT, uh, well, I'll put it this way, nothing in crypto is safe. <laughs> okay, that, that's, uh, that's the hard truth. Um, Nothing's 100% completely safe, right? But also, you know, nothing is 100% completely safe. Um, you know, you're not guaranteed to wake up tomorrow either. Uh, that's also another hard truth. But, you know, and I realize things are, you know, on a spectrum of likelihood, like probably you're going to, right? Um, but yeah, same thing. Like, there's some things in crypto that are probably fine, um, but nobody knows for sure. But let's actually let's look, at, let's look at something yesterday that came up. Uh, as it result, as it uh, relates to Toronto Cash, which we were just talking about, and Tether, which somebody just asked. Uh, so basically, Tether sticks to the decision not to ban, not to bar Toronto Cash addresses. So you know, one of the sort of backlashes from the Toronto Cash incident is that we've seen some major stablecoin, centralized stablecoin issuers like blacklist Toronto Cash addresses. So like, if you have USDC. Uh, in Tornado, you can't withdraw it, or like you can't send it to uh, the protocol. Okay, and uh, here we see Tether saying they're not going to bar Tornado Cash addresses. So this is an interesting thing. Um, you know, it's a competitive advantage for Tether in this case if people want to uh, use Tether's all right Tether coins USDT um, to you know transact with Toronto Cash. Now, <laughs> making this a lot harder too because, you know, we're seeing um we're seeing lots of other uh, uh node providers essentially, you know, um blacklist these addresses as well. So that's not that's not the actual blockchain nodes themselves. It's just like the endpoints like for if if say you use a service like Infura or Alchemy like in most cases, like you're not going to be able to transact with these addresses. Okay, uh, that doesn't mean that there's censorship at the protocol level. It just means that there's censorship at the service provider level. Okay, uh, since I've used your MetaMask stuff like that, they can be powered by these endpoints. You're going to get blacklisted, um, or they're going to be blacklisted. You're not necessarily going to be blacklisted. Um, but so so you know, if people want to do this type of stuff, it's it's getting increasingly harder to do. But at the end of the day, like people can run their own nodes, right? You can you can run your own client. Um, 
to make transactions on the blockchain, okay, then who's going to censor that, <laughs> right? Like you could just run a node and then, you know, connect your MetaMask to your own node, right? Or if you can't use a MetaMask wallet, like you can still make transactions uh, with a different wallet, uh, or write your own software to do it, okay? And then you have open access to Ethereum itself, all right? Unless your ISPs for some reason blocks your ability to actually do peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, transfers like that, then then you know you should still be able to do it. And so you know you could you could actually still control a wallet that uses Tether if you want to have stable coins. The other thing is Ether, the asset itself, being something that's highly censorship resistant because. It's not programmable. It's not an ERC twenty token. Nobody custodies it, right? Or no, no, no I shouldn't nobody custodies it. What I mean is nobody is an issue, like the centralized issuer, like the blockchain's in control of it of itself. Okay. Um. So you know, it, there's there's definitely ways to be one hundred percent off grid with uh you know running your own node, holding your tokens in ether, all right? Not using other people's wallet software, um. You know, custom your own funds, not holding it on an exchange, that type of stuff. Um, yeah, there's always. I mean, that's like one of the value propositions of of blockchain in the first place, and decentralization is the ability to self custody and you know have that censorship resistance. Somebody's asking about. Um, have I used Remix? Um, yes. I definitely use Remix in several of my tutorials. Uh, go check out the one I put out recently on uh, Solidity. So a four-hour course. If you go to my YouTube homepage, okay, you can go check that out. And you can see that it uses Remix inside. Actually, I don't know if we use Remix in that one. Hold on a second. I forget what to, what I did. Hold on. You go here. Go to my free blockchain development courses. I think it's this one actually. I think this is like a ninety minute tutorial where I use Remix. I think this one we use Hard Hat to write the contracts and write the tests. This is a much longer one. I guess we use Remix and there's some, but I think we quickly switch over to Hard Hat. Uh, somebody says, uh, yeah, no. so people are upset that Heroku is in the free dino tier. Um, yeah, so basically if you host applications on Heroku for free, uh, they're going to sunset that service. So you got a couple options. You can either pay for a hobby developer dino, which I think is like $7 a month. It's like, it's like super cheap. Uh, or you can just change hosting providers. Um, so you can look at like Fleek. That's one we've used a lot here. At DAP University, they also have like support to deploy your projects to IPFS. Okay, um, so you know you can see Fleek here. Okay, so you can just connect your GitHub account. It's pretty easy to deploy your projects. That's one alternative. Someone says Solana programming is the worst. Solana smart contracts are great, but not beginner friendly. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I've uh, tried to push people. You know, definitely towards uh, Solidity. It's a pretty beginner-friendly programming language. Like, like, there's, like, there, there's, there's all the, like, there's so many reasons why you'd want to stay in the Ethereum and EVM camp because you know it's the largest developer ecosystem. It's got the largest amount of use cases, largest number of users. Okay, and then also from the programming language perspective, like Solidity is a fairly beginner-friendly language in the grand scheme of things. It's a high-level language, whereas Rust is going to be harder for beginners to learn. There's a lot more low-level stuff that you have to do that's going to be much more challenging for you to grasp, especially if you're just starting from scratch. Uh, so one other thing I want to bring up here that I thought was pretty cool uh, for developers to check out, and even if you're not a developer, maybe this could whet your appetite for development. Um, so this is a pretty cool tool. I haven't tried this yet, but I just saw people talking about it, and I wanted to bring it up. So it's called OtterScan. So it is an open source Ethereum blockchain explorer. Okay. So basically you can spin up your own version of EtherScan. All right. Let's take a look here.
And so you can see all the code here on GitHub. Okay, it's totally public, totally open source. And you see sort of a demo of uh, Otter Scan and how it works here. If I can get the video to play. <laughs> So that's going to be a big deal, uh, especially for other chains that are popping up. It's getting to be easier and easier to spin up your own EVM compatible chain because, while well, you could just fork the client software, you can do stuff with it, and uh, now you can have Block Explorer tools basically for free off the shelf uh, with open source cloning and forking. You fork MetaMask, you can do all this type of stuff. You can basically just spin up an entire new chain uh, ecosystem overnight or over a weekend if you really wanted to. All right, everybody, so that's all I got for today. As always, you know, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. It really helps videos out so that more people learn about blockchain. And, you, you know, if you're as fast as the technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? You can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find those free courses there, like this person was asking about before. You know, like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or, hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can share a master blockchain step-by-step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I found people with zero coding experience, you know, change their careers, become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time.